Thank you all so much. Um, yes, I am from New Orleans, and we very rarely fly into hurricanes from New Orleans. We tend to fly away from them. We're a little gun shy. So I did make my call up here before I got on that plane to see where this thing was going. So, but I do want to thank you for having me. Um, we talked, uh, what a wonderful presentation is ahead of me, so I don't have to talk about the disease itself. I get to speak on what I really like to do and what we do in, um, in nutrition. So that'll be what we'll be doing today. And I don't let you just sit there and listen. I'm going to have you work a little bit. We're going to do a little active learning as we do this. They uh, made me go back and learn a little bit about education and being an educator this year. And I'm going to use that on y'all. So we will actively, which will help because we're all freezing to death in here. And so moving around and shaking your arms and everything will be a little helpful. So we'll, we'll be doing some active practicing. Um, with that, I'm going to give you a little, in your handout, I send a little things ahead. One of the things I sent ahead is this little piece of paper, and it has the Choose My Plate. This is what we use as our base. This replaced the food pyramid. This is the USDA food plan now. So I want you to go ahead and take this out, because we're going to actively work with this as we go along when we kind of get to the meal plan part. But if I say something during the talk that applies to you, if I say people that have this tend not to tolerate fat, then I want you to write, write on, if it applies to you, I want you to put at the top of your paper, low fat, okay? If I tell you too much of something, too much fiber would cause something and that happens to you, I want you to put low fiber or high fiber, all right? If you're losing weight, I want you to put a little thing that says high calorie. If you need to lose weight, you might want to put low calorie. I've got spouses in here too. We're not all patients, so I know we all have different things. But what I want to do is, I can. Uh, some of you may be diabetic. Put that on your paper because we're going to tie all this together as we get to a little bit of um, a pl meal planning in just a little while. But I want you to listen and so you have to be writing down <clears throat> the different groups just put your what applies to you, and then we're going to talk about the groups. If I happen to mention a food that I tell you really won't work for you, go ahead and put it or eliminate it on your sheet. But I want you to have a working sheet. So we're going to go through that as we go. But first, let's go through just some of the effects, the role of the diet uh, in the life of patients that are living with neuroendocrine tumors and see uh, if we can help uh, inform you a little bit more about how you can help do your uh, meals at home a little bit better and reduce your symptoms. So today, I want to really just give you a brief overview. We've had wonderful overviews already about the neuroendocrine tumors, and so I'm not going to have to do that, and that's a wonderful thing. But I am going to go through some of the symptoms that are related to uh, nutrition that are related to neuroendocrine tumors. Identify a healthy diet based on symptoms. I apply some of these foods into the diet uh, and let you know where the resources. And then we're going to summarize by doing some diet adjustments um, that we want to do to make sure that we improve the quality of life because that's really our goal in nutrition is to improve quality of life, keep you from having the symptoms that decrease uh, your ability to function as well as you'd like to. So the first thing, we already went through this, uh, the overexpression of hormones. We've heard all about this this morning and the serotonins and the peptides. But what I want you to know is this does affect the diet. Or, what, or the outcomes of diet, what, what happens in your GI tract. Uh, overexpression can create uh, some of the dietary functions to be altered. Uh, one of the big things that we do is a lot of surgery. I work with some fine surgeons in New Orleans, and we're always altering that GI tract. So many times it's just a change that we've done from surgery, surgery, taking things out, reconnecting things, removing organs. And so that will be a part of it. So that will change. It changes the function and sometimes the motility of the, the GI tract. Um, we want to look at what organs are involved and the surgical procedures that to repair or to alter change in those, um, in those organs because that will take a change in your diet as well. Many of us uh, have, if, that it may have been to surgery, I say of us because they've done this to me too. From our surgeons, if you come close to a gallbladder, they take it. And so <laughs> I don't know how many of that happens around here, but we do a lot of gallbladder removals when we, to prevent some of the side, more serious side effects of the drugs that we have to use. And then I see I'd left a C out of medication, um, but uh, medication and treatment plays a big part in these symptoms as well. So first we want to just talk about a little bit, and I'm glad this is usually, thank goodness this is before lunch, usually I do it during lunch. It's always a wonderful, uh, they, um, we talked about Dr. Waltering. For y'all that don't know Dr. Waltering, he is uh, another 
uh, specialist in neuroendocrine tumors and go back 100 years. 100 years, right? We're going to tell him. He goes back 100 years uh, with this group. And um, he uh, has worked very hard um, in, in this area for a long time. And if he was here, he would have introduced me straight up as the queen of diarrhea. I'm the queen of poop. And, um, and so that's how I get these roles is I really am. I don't want the crown for that. Please don't bring it to me. But I am, in his eyes, the queen of poop. I know how to manage this well. And it's all very different. So, so what I do when you come to see me, I'm going to determine why. All diarrhea is not the same. It's very different, actually. And it shouldn't be treated the same. So we're going to go through that so you know how to treat what your symptoms are. But they're usually related to an osmotic diarrhea. That means it's a pool, it's a concentration. Secretory diarrhea. Secretory diarrhea, we're going to talk about more. That's overexpression of the hormones that, uh, and serotonin and the different uh, proteins uh, that occur. Um, decreased contact surface, surface area means we've just taken out too much of the GI tract or something to absorb. And, but more times than not, it's just a combination of all of these. So it's a contributing factor to the osmolytic diarrhea. I don't know how that turned black instead of white, so that's pretty typical of computer with me now these days. But uh, the, uh, this is going to be related to a malabsorption. So people that have a lactose intolerance will have an osmolytic intolerance. Other ones are sorbitol. Sometimes when we put people on sugar-free foods, they get into too much sorbitol because it's a sweetener, it's an alcohol sweetener that we see, especially in gummy bears and different things like that that'll do it. But also other things that people tend to get into in high amounts, uh, mannitol, epsom salts, it's an old thing, we don't see that quite as much, thank goodness, and antacids. But if we stop feeding you, we can stop this diarrhea. This is different than secretory. Secretory diarrhea that's caused by your tumors we cannot stop. That's one reason we know it. If you're going to the, to the bathroom during the night or away from foods, or if we put an IV in you and put you on IVs and no food for three days. Now, we don't do that. That's just a, an example. But you would still have stools. Okay, secretories, you, you're going to keep having them. They're not, they're not going to stop. The other ones will stop. So contributing to secretory, you have an over, you have the, the secretion of water exceeds absorption rate. Bacterial toxins, that's what poisoning. Uh, can do this. Some of the dry, uh, drugs that we use, whether they be laxative, some of the asthma medicines are real bad about doing this. Antidepressants can do that. Some of our cardiac medicines can do a secretory. Heavy metals, organic toxins, um, insecticides, mushrooms, and caffeine. I want you to take into that. All these bad things and caffeine can cause uh, secretory diarrhea. So usually um, the ones that we see that are associated with a tumor secretion, uh, vipomas, they tend to be the most aggressive, and these patients will tend to use, lose their electrolytes as well with their uh, stools and um, tend to dehydrate and have involuntary weight loss as well. Um, the uh, gastrins, we've heard a lot about this morning, they overproduce gastrin, and um, the gastrin issues will con uh, really contribute to some of the issues that we have with um, digesting foods as well. But the carcinoids over um, secrete histamine, serotonin, and polypeptides, and it's the over secretion of these that make the foods a little bit hard to absorb and digest or, or to work the way we want to and maybe how they have in the past, depending on the amount of tumor that you have. Some of the non-secretory, in other words, these are things that are more related to diet or disease, are um, short bowel syndrome, if they've gone in and had to take out tumor uh, once, twice, three times, and every time we keep kind of shortening that bowel up, then you're going to have a decreased amount of small bowel. At one time we thought it had to be just um, a pretty excessive, and, and I'll tell you from practice, it really doesn't have to be very excessive to have some issues with it dumping in. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, celiac sprue. <clears throat> celiac sprue, we do have neuroendocrine patients that have celiac sprue, not that they're related, but we just have a lot of celiac sprue in, in population uh, being found now. Um, pancreatic insufficiency is one of the biggest problems that we have. Um, that can be related to even the medicines that we've talked about today that are so good. Well, when you, they do what they do to suppress some of the secretory diarrhea, they also can suppress some of the release of di uh, digestive enzymes, and that tends to be one of the biggest problems we have causing in you know, pancreatic insufficiency. Gallbladder removal, I told you that already. They take that out, and that changes the, well, the bile and the digestive enzymes enter and um, can increase your diarrhea. Um, and cause really actually a laxative effect in the colon. Intestinal surgeries, we talked about that. Bile acid colitis, this is, can um, occur 
as well. And then the bacteria overgrowth, and that's we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But sometimes if we take you too long, we don't feed you after surgeries, you'll get bacteria overgrowth. Sometimes just from the diet or medications will do that as well. And then the drug-induced uh, somatostatin analogs that we've talked about today, they can do that. That's where they just suppress the uh, pancreatic enzymes usually. So what we're going to try to do is to change food into energy. So we're going to take the intake of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats and try to get them to absorb without resulting in foamy stools, runny stools, or fatty stools. So that's the challenge that a dietitian has, is, um, is to try to match what you can absorb and prevent um, as much of the complications of the um, abnormal stool. So when we do a, an assessment, or when I'm looking at patients and listening to patients uh, tell me about what's going on, the first thing that we're going to try to find out is when they have the stools. When are they more problematic? We know that, um, that this can be a rapid transit. Just when you eat, you go 30 minutes, 60 minutes, right after that meal. That's going to tell me a lot. Usually that's a transit time. And if I can reduce transit time with um, diet and, and medication, then we can improve that one. So that one's a little bit easier. Watery explosive is usually um, related to a lot of the fat malabsorption and the bile, bile salt in particular, and always with secretory. Um, floaty foul stools, it's steatorrhea. It is fat malabsorption, and um, usually people's spouses tell me about it, so I know you have it. Dietary factors that worsen the diarrhea, so there really are a lot of effects uh, for diet. So we're going to go through these so you know it, and you may hear some of these foods. So if you hear some of the foods that you may not be doing well, go ahead and jot them, jot them down on that sheet. If, you can, if your hands aren't frozen, use that pen. And let's go through this a little bit. So caffeine, we talked about caffeine. I didn't, we don't, I'm humane, I usually don't take away a cup of coffee in the morning in small amounts. But if you're drinking coffee all day long, that caffeine definitely plays a factor. It can be in coffee, it can be in tea, colas, over-the-counter drugs. Uh, medications can do this quite often as well. Um, fructose, fruit sugars, these things in quantities can pass through the gut unabsorbed. They tend to be the biggest cause of short bowels uh, related uh, diarrhea, emptying too fast in the transit time. So we really reduce these usually. Um, apple juice, pear juice, grapes, honey, dates, nuts, big soft drinks, uh, fruit flavored soft drinks, prunes, sugar-free gums, mints, sweets, sweet cherries, um, in other words the ones that are in sugars, as well as the ones that can be naturally, um, and then the prunes. Lactose intolerance is, a, is another big factor, and that's the milk, some of the yogurts, and then soft cheeses as well. Hard cheeses don't have the lactose involved. Um, use the medications to control these. You may have already been put on these. Many of you, uh, you will ha already be on these medications um, and, and to help regulate and control your diarrhea and your steatorrhea. The first ones are just anti-diarrhea drugs. These are the ones you should, some of these you just can get over the counter, Imodium, uh, Kaopechate, and People kind of don't use them enough, I think, because of the importance that they, they can get them at the drugstores. So they don't realize the importance of them, but these are very important. If you've been prescribed them, do take them as you've been prescribed. It's very important that we reduce that transit time in the GI tract. Sometimes it's even worse. We can't control it, and we'll go up to a little higher uh, drug, which is a tincture of opiates uh, or even codeine in some cases. And this is to, it, if you've ever had to take pain medicines, you may have noticed before, and for patients that don't have GI problems, sometimes they'll get very, very constipated. I mean, they'll have really, their bowels will almost lock up. They'll feel like they'll lock up because of that, that pain medicine-induced uh, constipation. Cholestyramine is um, a drug that we use to absorb bile. Once it's, we don't have that gallbladder anymore, it just kind of seeps into the body. If you don't go, if you go a long time without eating, you can smell food and it'll, it'll drop. So stress can drop it. So we, we have a drug, um, it, it's in powder form. They can use one similar in appeal. Um, I, I, have, I use it too. So uh, this is one that I, uh, I, I use the powder form. And I, it usually it's ordered a pack and you put it in a little water. It'll say juice, don't use juice because we know the juice is problematic. You really do better in water. It's usually flavored with orange or something. We try to do the sugar-free one because there are some people that don't do well with aspartame, and if you don't, then we have to use a different mechanism and you know use the sugar one. But um, you can you can do that and just take it right, drink it before you eat your meals, and it'll help. The scavenger it doesn't absorb in the body; it's more of a sponge, and it just captures that bile and it's going to carry it out of the body for you, so it stops that that type of diarrhea. 
And how you know you have that type of read a little bit is um, it's pretty rapid and it, it can be um, uncontrollable urge and it can mm -hmm. also um, be yellow or, or tarry kind of tinge to it and it burns your bottom. This one really can, you, you can really feel this one many times and that's how one, you know, it really gives me a real clue of what's going on with you. Pancreatic enzymes are very valuable in the treatment of fat malabsorption. And um, at one time it was, it was a little bit controversial back when I got into this a long time ago, wasn't it? I mean, we, did, we were just, I didn't know any better. I'd been treating pancreatic cancers for many, many years and it was a real standard with the use of pancreatic. And it took me a while, I came in with Dr. Lowell Anthony of 2002, so it's been a few years now and um, had to get good at carcinoid because that's what he was doing. So I had to really learn this. And this is one of the first things that I learned is that it, even being naive is that we had to digest the foods before we can get you to absorb it. And then probiotics, we talked a little bit about the overgrowth of bacteria and probiotics are very good at helping reduce this overgrowth of bacteria in your GI tract and I really do recommend them. So things, other things that actually can uh, increase it as well is activity. Um, that's why we try to put your feedings and your meals away from when you're going to be real active if we can control it. Stress and hope, you know, I wish I had the magic to, to control stress in everybody's lives. That's a real, real hard thing to do, but it is very important in managing your nutrition. And then we watch the foods. We're going to reduce the concentrated sweets. Or we're going to try to mix uh, some of the solids and the liquids differently. I usually, uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but we usually put the foods 30 to, I mean the fluids 30 to 45 minutes before the meal or 45 minutes after the meal. So we're gonna, you're gonna do foods by themselves and you're gonna do just sips of water to get it down. You're not gonna do your volume. Your volume of uh, fluids are gonna come before your meals or after with. And it, it makes a lot of difference in that transit time as well as how much uh, food we can get in without getting you too full. So those play two parts. Um, extreme hots and colds just stimulate the GI tract. So we're gonna try to keep, you don't have to have it lukewarm or, or room temperature, but I tell them not McDonald's hot and not uh, iced tea cold. You know, so we, we're gonna take it kind of in the middle. Fiber types play a big part of this. So s there's two types of fiber. There's the soluble fibers, fibers that are at the inside of the fruits and vegetables. They're inside of the beans. They are, um, uh, help the, uh, many of our grains. You may have heard, of, remember these back when we were doing the heart, got a cardiologist here, remember when we were trying to do better heart health and so we started doing the oatmeals and the Cheerios got a big part. These are the types of fibers that help the body uh, the best if, if you're tolerating, the, uh, if you're having diarrhea because they help the colon reabsorb water, they actually build a, a bulk, but they're not as irritating to the GI tract. They actually kind of a gel. They, 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 they will give you a, still a stool but not with the harshness of the insoluble vitamins, I mean, insoluble fibers. The insoluble fibers are the one we push on everybody else. If you're healthy and you're not having diarrhea, I want you to use insoluble fibers. Those are your whole grains, those are the pills and the skins on your vegetables, um, and they are very, very important. But if you're having diarrhea, these irritate the wall of the GI tract and these are gonna increase your diarrhea. So this is where we have to modify this diet. So we're gonna go through how we do that a little bit here in a few minutes. So why do I worry about chronic diarrhea? The biggest reason I worry is because it causes involuntary weight loss. Um, adequate, you're, able to, you're not able to absorb the, um, the amount of calories you need in a day, even if you're eating them, you're not absorbing them. Um, you lose a lot of vitamins and minerals when you're losing stool. And we already heard about the fat soluble vitamins. If you're having floaty stools, then you're probably losing the fat soluble vitamins as well. And that's A, D, E, and K. And so, uh, we have to watch those um, and we actually do have some vitamins that are specific to people that have fat malabsorption then they cross over on a water molecule type so we, we can help you with that if you're having especially with um, with some of the peanuts and and uh, vipoma in particular the magnesium and the potassium will really go low but that can on chronic diarrhea we see that as well and somebody ought to watch those um, and, and make sure. Remember though in high amounts of magnesium, and this comes in too, people see it low, they give a lot of magnesium and that causes diarrhea as well. So you have to watch the, the, the magnesium intake as well. Um, uncontrolled stools, uncontrolled stools usually is a, if it's, um, it just is a quality of life or, and you can't get out of the house and you can't go anywhere. 
So we want to control those as best we can because we want you to be able to function. That, you know, I have a room full of patients here with these diseases and you're still here and you're here in five years and you're here in 10 years. And, and so this is one that I want you to have the best quality of life you can have. And if I can get, help control these things for you, then we're gonna have great outcomes and we're gonna have a lot of, a lot of time um, to be addressing these same issues. So we want to try to, to get these as best in control as we can. And then gas and bloating, and that's probably the biggest complication that we have um, uh, with people in, is that many times because of the fact uh, that you're not absorbing things very well, it's um, causing both carbohydrate and fat malabsorption. So we talked about this a lot. You can tell this is a big part of what we do. It's, uh, I can't stress enough, quality of life is our concern. So um, fatigue, is probably could also consider one of the worst aspects of the physical distress and most common reasons for um, some of the social restriction, uh, the diarrhea as well. And then um, we see that the worry and about the illness and the distress of that can cause uh, the quality of life to be as reduced as well. So let's review the nutritional status real quick. So when you come in to see a diet, a dietitian, or if you see your physician, you ought to have your current weight should be checked every time you go in, even if you're just going to get your injection. Because your physicians in this may not see you, if you're coming, you may not see you at three and six months intervals. So we don't want you to get six months down the road and have lost a lot of weight and that's not known it. So when you go in and get your shots, you should have your weight checked. So we know weight changes um, throughout the year. Uh, we want to compare it to your usual weight. I don't care if you weigh 250 pounds and you're five foot three. If you've lost 25 pounds in two or three months, it's significant. So it's not so much what you weigh, but it's the change of weight over time. Same thing with gaining weight over time. That's really the most important part. Although I don't want you to be underweight. If you're doing that, I'm gonna push you up as high as I can to get you back within uh, line with uh, what we consider um, best outcome. And we use a measurement called body mass index. That's the BMI, I should have written that out for y'all. But these are indicators that give us a, a little bit better of how your health is. So we know that if you're less than 18.5 BMI, and that's a measurement of height and weight divided by white squared, but we just see it, we do these equations. It's based on your height and weight. And if you're less than 18.5, you're underweight. If you're greater than 25, but less than 30, you're just starting to get into an overweight. And then if you're over the, um, the 35, we're considering that obese. Um, hand grips now measured as a way of telling malnutrition. This the Aspen guidelines for malnutrition has changed. We used to all watch albumin, and I still watch albumin. An old dietitian is going to take me a long time, but because it tells me my third spacing uh, risk. So, but we do see hand wrist grip now. We used to do it when the doctor came in and he would shake your hand or she would shake your hand. That was one way that they were seeing. You know, could you shake back? I think that that was a real simple um, way to measure this. Now they have sophisticated things that you can pump, hold, and squeeze for us to measure those. But that usually tells us how well you're doing. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're really getting weak, we can usually tell it by a hand grip. Um, when you're getting lab work done, you're gonna usually get a CMP, which is just a metabolic panel. It's gonna tell us your glucose, your sodium, your potassium. You know, that gives us a whole indicator of things that we're just gonna look at and see how you're doing as well. Hemoglobin. Uh, vitamin D, we heard about this already. Our fat soluble vitamins, we have to watch those. General population has trouble with these. But if you're having steatorrhea, um, this is one area we really we, we, we want to watch and we want to replace. Um, Stool's Brack scale, and I don't know if somebody else is using the Brack scale to speak today, but I did notice they put it in your, um, in your handout, so I'm just so excited. Because we are trying to come up with some ways to measure and to judge how people do. So this is a, it's really explained well to you, so I won't have to go through it all for you. Um, and because I know it is before lunch and not everyone wants to hear about poop. But it will give you an idea of kind of where you are and what's going on. So you can tell your doctor, look, I have a BRAC5 stool. You know, you can be really smart. Or I've got, you know, so, but it does give us a measurement so we can kind of tell what's going on with you. And then I'm going to look at previous surgeries and, um, and anything that's been rerouted. The characteristics of steatorrhea, and that's one of our biggest problems with steatorrhea, is that you just have a, a, a really high amount of uh, fecal fat expressed in your stools. It's usually large and greasy. It's foul smelling. Uh, st the stool will usually float. Sometimes you can even see droplets in it, and sometimes it'll even be a pale stool. Um, some of our, uh, the anti-diarrhea medications can start to use the, work with uh, any of the diarrhea symptoms. 
um, but it only treats the symptoms. So it may not really affect the um, fat in your stool. So that may, so we want to transit time, we're going to use these, but we may not be able to use them with all of our different stool problems. Uh, it will slow down your movement of your gut and it allows time for the food, for the water to be absorbed and so it's less watery. Sometimes when I have a patient in, I'll ask them um, about, well, I'll ask everybody about the stools, but I'll ask them, you know, in the morning when you wake up, how is it? And then um, they'll tell me, well, I start off okay. And then as I get during the day, it gets watery. So if you've slept all night and you stayed real still, sometimes we can get enough water reabsorption in, during the nighttime period so that, I, that you can get a normal stool in the morning. I know that it has to do with water absorption because I can see that we have at least one, you know, something with some absorption there. So if I can get you to be still a little bit longer, I can get a little bit better absorption. We want to pro probiotics. Uh, these have taken a really big pre uh, move in the, in, um, in the um, media. Uh, it's also picked up a lot in, um, in commercial use now. We have a lot of availability of it. Um, <clears throat> it's really to try to reduce this um, growth, um, overgrowth of bacteria. People that have been on antibiotics or, um, or stay on antibiotics tend to have problem with this a good bit. But if you've ever gone through a one really big treatment of an antibiotic, or sometimes even chemotherapy, and then all of a sudden you're just really running behind it. You know, it's usually from this, this bacterial overgrowth, and so we'll have to treat that. Um, and then, of course, high by, in high doses, it's another one that a little bit's good, a lot's better. No, high doses this can actually increase your gas and diarrhea. So you want to use real reasonable amounts, and your um, your uh, practitioners will help you judge this. Um, cholestyramine we talked about already and its, judge, its, its job is just really just to collect that bile salt um, and to keep it from causing your diarrhea. It's going to, um, it is caused by gallbladder removal or presence of short bowel syndrome. It's not absorbed and, um, but it does interact or it binds with some of the cardiac medicines, so you have to get cleared by your pharmacist and your physician, or we change the timing of these by a couple of hours to get the absorption correct, because we don't want to interfere with any of the good medications that you're on. In large amounts, the biggest complaint we have is then you go from having six stools a day down to one or none, and you get a little constipated, and then people quit using the drug because they get scared. What we've learned is that you can use, tit we titrate it up now. We start at a half a pack instead of a whole pack and see how they do, and we may need one pack a day, we may need two. So we, this can be, but because we're using it in powder form, we can, we, titrate means just use a different amount. So we can use a smaller amount and see how that does and then move you up a little bit. So that it's easier to, to adjust you with that medication. Um, Steatorrhea is really it's the insufficient um, release of lipase, which is one of the enzymes that digest fat. It is the enzyme that digests fat. Uh, short bowel syndrome, we've cut your bowel, we shortened it, gallbladder removal, and then side effects of the somatostatins. Pancreatic enzymes can be ordered, and um, the ones over the counter that you find in the health food store have about five units of lipase. The ones that we order you from prescription usually have 50,000 units of lipase, and you need the lipase in those amounts to be able to digest the food. So if you're sub, if we, they're giving you just a little bit, it won't, do, it won't be enough. So we have to make sure that we get enough of the pancreatic enzymes to do, uh, do enough good. Um, it also helps to digest carbohydrates and protein as well, but usually it's the lipase that we're having the most trouble with. We want you to make, one of the biggest problems we saw with using it is the order would just say take three times a day, and what you want to do is make sure you're taking it before the feeding. Used to you take it an hour before, but now you can take it closer to your, your meals. The main thing, only thing I don't want you to do is take it and not eat. I mean, that's why we put it close to meals now, it, when they reformulate it. It's so that you take it and then you're going to eat, because we don't want you with an empty stomach taking it, because it can work on the lining and irritate the lining. Um, if you don't take pancreatic enzymes, we're going to have to adjust the fat amounts in your diet, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So here we go to the fun part. So we want to do a healthy diet for patients based on symptoms. Foods are very different. The types of, uh, they're really little chemistry sets, but it, 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 we don't really think of that. We just think of they're kind of good, they taste good, we enjoy eating. Um, so we don't think of those aspects, but it is some things that we really have to change. And the first thing that we change is the size of the feeding. This will tell you what, a, uh, this is a really good example of um, 
what we typically could get at restaurants. Um, people put a lot of hidden fats in foods because they make them taste good. People put a lot of hidden spices and other things in foods that can really irritate you. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about them. I um, am kind of a very cautious and almost an anti uh, MSG person because I see so many symptoms related to MSG. But again, it's one of these amines, and we do know it in high doses. I mean, we have trouble with the general population having diarrhea. I'm going to keep saying, Dr. Walter is pushing me. I'm going to start. I'd love to do a study on this. Maybe we'll get that one off the ground to see if it actually how bad this really is. But most restaurants still use accent in the kitchen, and the accent is uh, MSG. Um, so we have to be careful with that as well. But you can see how we can take a plate, a 10-inch plate, um, we, which you probably would not absorb well, and then change it into something that's much more doable. Although I would tell you on my plate, probably wouldn't have that uh, broccoli on it. It would probably have green beans and carrots on it for you. Um, but that's the main thing, is just adjusting these amounts um, to reduce the stool output. So we're going to adjust the proteins. Um, the proteins need to start with being lean. So we want low fat protein sources. And our protein sources, and, and um, this, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about it, but when we get to the meal plan and we're gonna talk, I'll give you even more. Proteins are beef. Beef is, has to have a lot of acid in the stomach to digest, so a lot of people have problems with beef. Um, if it's lean, it's not fatty, it's, not, it's okay. I mean, we don't, and, and as far as a risk of um, cancers related to red meat, uh, the American Institute of Cancer Research tells you that you can have up to 18 ounces of red meat a week. That includes beef, pork, lamb, and so pork is not really the other white meat. It's actually considered a red meat in, in, a, in a meal plan. So, um, so those, are, those are the beef, uh, the red meats. Your um, ch poultry, chicken, fish, uh, game, game birds, uh, Cornish hens, these things are all fine to use. We do try to, and many people have to take off some of the skins off of them um, to get the tolerance down a little bit. Um, the um, couple of plant foods, the, my favorite is quinoa, and we went out to eat last night, and she would have thought that I had this planned, but I didn't. But one of my favorite proteins to use, because it does absorb well in this population, and it's actually very handy to use, and it's especially, it's only, one of the only things I can use in my vegetarians, and that's quinoa. Q-U-I-N-O-A, quinoa. And it is a grain, but it is our only total protein that's a plant source. And it's kind of fun to work with, and you can do a lot with it. And uh, I can even make it almost unhealthy if you come. Uh, um, I'll show you how. We'll talk about a recipe I do in a minute. But, uh, and then, um, so these are the main, but beans and peas. And we can, but those are not necessarily, uh, lentils do pretty well. Um, some peas do okay. Um, gabonzo beans, white navies uh, do pretty good. The ones we really have trouble with just before the gas formation and the irritate uh, is um, red beans, black beans, and pintos um, tend to be a little bit rough. Everybody's different. I tell people if you cook them southern soft as much as we do and you just cook them to death, sometimes anybody can get them. But um, with beans, um, the one of the things to remember is that if you take beans and you soak them overnight or you do the bowl for 10 minutes and let them sit for an hour, those are both systems of trying to hide, rehydrate. If you rinse them five times in warm water, it reduces the, the fermentation and it will reduce the gas. So rinse beans after you've hydrated them five times, but don't use cold water because it makes them tough. So you want to use warm water on them, okay? All right. Carbohydrates, these are very important in our diet, aren't they? They're your energy source. In other areas of oncology, we tend to concentrate these carbohydrates and we use a lot of fruit juice and we use a lot of simple carbs because we need to get a lot of concentration. But this group and you and, and my patients do not tolerate simple carbohydrates. So we take sugars and fruit juice. Fruit juice we're gonna dilute. You tolerate about five grams of sugar at a time. And, and, and some people a little bit more, some people a little bit less. When we're reading labels, that's real important. But if I can dilute water, uh, juice has 15 grams in a half a cup. So if I do one third juice, two thirds water, I've gotten a five gram concentration and usually you can tolerate that. So I don't have to take the juice all the way out, but I am gonna have to draw off it. Um, so, but the fruits, um, fruits themselves are fine. We're going to take the skins and peels off of it if you're having trouble with diarrhea, and I cook a lot of them. I, 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 uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. If I had a diet 
it would be mashed and pureed because I can get you absorb that on the worst days. So uh, there's sometimes when we talk about modifying, I really will take things down a little bit to a different consistency. All your pastas, your rice, they're all tolerated really well. Breads, if you, if you do okay with wheat, some people are a little wheat intolerant, some people are a little gluten intolerant, and it does cause a little gas, but gluten's taken way out of the realm of real, um, really being a problematic um, in, in, a, in a population because it's a, it's a $10 million uh, industry now in the food industry, and they have taken it way out of proportion. But there are still do have patients that, and especially for celiac sprue, that's a, it, it really has to be brought down. Uh, and we, we minimize those. Um, but for the most part, we can still use all those breads. Now, if we're gonna have trouble with diarrhea, we take out the whole grains. So you're gonna use carbohydrates that have two grams of fiber from insoluble or less. So it does change a little bit. But if we're doing a low fiber diet, because you're having a lot of diarrhea, that means that we're trying to go for, for around, about between 10 and 15 grams of fiber a day. We really have to drop it. If you're having obstructions, we may have to take it even lower than that. But if you're not, your bowel's not obstructed and you're having diarrhea, we can use fibers, but they need to be soluble fibers versus the insoluble fibers. The seeds, nuts, outside peels, are, are where we get the most of them. The, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about different carbohydrates in, uh, that you may not have talked about before, but we're gonna go on with those potatoes, uh, are a real staple. Um, fats. If you've seen the coconut oil, medium chain triglycerides and the coconut oil they, that are now on the market, it was so hard to find these for so many, many years and they were expensive. And now with another one of these marketing uh, gimmicks, uh, we got medium chain triglycerides and co coconut available to really real reasonable at the grocery store. Medium chain triglycerides were linked back in the day to heart disease and their saturated fats. But for patients that are having trouble with fat absorption, these medium chain triglycerides, coconut oil, can actually absorb differently and it can help give us a calorie source for you and something to help palatable, something that you can absorb better. So we do use it in this arena. I tell people it makes everything taste a little bit like a pina colada, but that's not necessarily bad either. So we, we do use some of that. But the other fats are still fats. And you, if you're having fat absorption, whether it be a healthy fat like olive oil or it be uh, one that we may not consider as much, some of our uh, corn oils and, and the different ones, they all play the same, and um, the, the, the malabsorption will still be the same. This also counts for fish oil. We didn't talk about fish. I should have put, I don't know why I didn't say fish and proteins. Fish is one of my favorite proteins, um, and, and the one that's most tolerated. Eggs are also one of our proteins that's tolerated fairly well. It's a little gassy in some people, and some people we have to use more egg whites and less egg yolks. Um, but uh, when we get to fats, the one that I had the most trouble with is avocado. So in my paperwork, I'll have avocado on the no list and sometimes on the do list. So some of these we cross over. Avocados are very high in, um, in fats. They're really a, a fatty vegetable. And um, if you just had the serving size, which is about, well, actually, I can give it to you, the serving of fat size is the end of my thumb. If you're getting that much avocado, you're okay. But guacamole doesn't usually come in that amount, and that's where I see people get into it. And so I have to put it on the no until I know how much up you're getting. So it's, it's again, it's the amount that you're getting. Um, fish oils, we talked about that. Uh, salmon, um, healthy in the, in the general population, healthy, healthy. But if you're not absorbing fats, that, that even that salmon is gonna have trouble with the, uh, cause some of the seatoria. So, so we got to watch the amounts again. And then the fluids, we really tend to be the ones that have no calories in them. We want them to be sugar-free, uh, low, simple carbs, uh, and then no caffeine um, as well as the carbonated drink. Um, it can also cause a lot of gas, so carbonation may actually be a factor. All right. Oh, it's being contrary. Let's see. <laughs> it's, it's not wanting to go. Try enter. There we go. So, um, did I go the right way? I went the wrong way? It's not going forward. Uh, that's right. It did. It switched back. It's been working just fine, and now it's, it's quit. I got it. Sorry, just wanted to exercise you. 
<laughs> okay, so the treatment plan. Now let's get to the real part of it. So the treatment plan. The pre we start with the treatment plan being take your medicine as prescribed. If you ordered uh, a medication, Imodium or one of the motility ones to take when you get up in the morning or before you go to bed, take it. If you take a pancreatic enzyme, take it. Make sure you take whatever they've given you to help digest. Now we're going to modify the diet. So we're going to maybe changing the type. We want to go to lean meats, maybe. We may want to change your fibers. We may have to change your carbohydrates a little bit. And then we want you to keep a record because if I, I think of it as a, it's a puzzle to me. If I can see your records, I can see people say, I can't tell the difference. I just can't, I just can't put it together. And we already heard that sometimes these tumors do, do things, they may not work today like they, do yes, you know, they did yesterday. They may be cycular. So we, it, we really have to watch it over a period of time. But if you keep those records and you take them into your dietitian and your nurses, many times they can help you. They can know what's going on and I can actually count your calories. And, that's how, and then I want you to report problems because I don't want to wait till you get back in six months and then find out that you've been miserable and that you've lost a lot of weight in six months. So here we go. This is going to be where we are going to... Um, Look at our choosemyplate.gov information because this is our Golders standard, standard. So when we start modifying a diet, we want to take this format and make it apply to everybody we have out there. And if we modify things correctly, we can still give you a very healthy diet even with the restrictions. And everybody in here, I can tell you, probably has different restrictions. So um, that's why it's hard to tell you. I can't come in here and give you one thing that's going to work for everybody in the room because we are very individual and everybody's intake is very different. So um, the first thing that we try to do is to try the food consistency. We may actually have to change the consistency of that food. We may have to mash it. We may have to cut it up. We may have to chop it. Uh, we want to watch portion control. Portion control is very, very important. Small amounts of certain things that may cause you to react. If you just do small amounts, you may not have any trouble. We know that some people have trouble with um, aged foods, the tyramines and, and the amines. And so if you get into the aged foods, um, the um, smoked meats, cheeses, alcohol, these things will make you flush. Many, sometimes this is serotonin related, sometimes it's histamine related. We know that we have a lot of histamine related uh, abnormals uh, in general population. Um, but um, so we have to really watch what yours are. But um, these are called um, trigger foods, and these trigger foods are these amines. Um, and I can get you a list of them, and we have them in many places. I'll make sure they're posted on your um, on your local support group if you don't have them. But the mo main ones we get in trouble with, and I can I can it can even be worse. But really, it's the it's the aged meats, pepperoni, um, nitrate foods, ham sometimes. Um, aged cheese, Stiltons, blue cheese, uh, cheddars, really the uh, more aged, the more problem. Um, tomatoes and tomato paste. Tomatoes have high histamine. That was kind of shocked me. So I had to go back and really look at the dynamics of it. And it's really high in histamines even in, in a raw form. But once you put it into a paste and they add fat to the paste, then it really becomes intolerable many times. So you know what I have the biggest problem with? Just think of what I just said. Cheese pepperoni, and tomato sauce. So what do you have the most trouble with? Pizza, okay? So why, I want you to have pizza. You love pizza, you want to have pizza. So what can I do? What can I help you with? Well, you know what does pretty well instead of a red sauce? Pasta, yeah, white sauce can do it. Pasta, or pestos. You can do some really, really exciting little pestos. And, and if you haven't, I'll be glad to describe those for you better if it's not something that you're familiar with. But many of the, uh, the pizza places do those now. They're a little bit healthier and they just, and it's, um, you've got to watch your fat a little bit in it, but these are very doable. And then we can do lean meats. We can put the chicken in on a pizza. We can put mushrooms on a pizza. We can use some of these vegetables as long as they're cooked down on pizzas. So, so we can change things. And then your cheese, um, cheese is a little bit tough. What we find a lot is amounts. I, I, I found that really a lot of my patients can use a little Parmesan here and there and not really get in too much trouble. I don't know about the same thing. I think we, we do okay in small amounts. And that's when we tune it adds a lot of flavor and a little amount. But you're not going to tolerate macaroni and cheese. Okay? That's the part that we're looking at. Again, it's the amounts. You know, it's too high in fat and too high in those other ones. But American cheese is a tolerated. It's I'm just not really so that it's really a cheese. But anyway, it is a cheese. 
And, but the low-fat part, it can be used in recipes, so we want to remember that's usually an alternative to what we're doing. So now we're going to go to watch your, get your sheets out. I got a challenge for you. And I have to get my cheater out to give it to you. Okay. If any, how many of y'all have seen the TV show where they give you that box? They say, this is your basket. Pick something out of this basket. I'm about to give you baskets, okay? And I want you to think about what you will come up with your basket. All right. I'm going to make this easy. I was going to break the room up, because, but we're not at table, so it's a little hard to break this one up and let everybody kind of game up. But you can use, first I want you to do it by yourself, and then I'm going to let you partner up and see what we come up with, and then we'll talk about it as a group. But let's do two sides of the room. This side of the room, this is your basket. You're going to have chicken breast. You're going to have rice. If you think, if you're having troubles that we have discussed, oh, and I'll give you a hint on this one. If you're having diarrhea, you really have to use white rice instead of brown rice. Why do we change the fibers so you'll understand that? If you're healthy, why do we give you a high fiber, insoluble fiber, the pills, the raw vegetables? Why do we give you that diet? Do y'all know? Anybody? We want things to go through you fast. We, will, we want things to go from your, from your mouth, we want them to di digest and we want them out of your GI tract so you do not expose the toxins that we consume and we can't stop it. But these things out of your body so that we don't increase your risk of colon cancer. Okay? That's the importance of them. So when we're trying to slow down a GI tract, what do we do? We do avoid the things that make it move fast. So then we're going to go back to more soluble white fiber instead of the whole grain, white bread instead of the whole grain. So when I give you the item, you can decide what your symptoms are, and you can say whether you can use the whole grain or do I need white bread. I want you to think through that. I want a thinking process here, okay? So chicken breast, rice. Carrots. Sliced peaches. We're going to say in their own juice. I'm going to take that sugar out for you. Cinnamon. And oatmeal. You can have your pantry. You know how they can go run and get the pantry stuff? If there's things you want to mix with that a little bit, I want you to do it. I want you to go to that pantry and you think of something you like and I need to add it to this dish. But I want you to come up with one dish and it can be an entree, it can be a bit. And um, just think about if you are making chicken, if you're going to cook a chicken and you're going to make a whole meal out of it, you need the meat part. Let's look at our plate. You need your meat, chicken. You need your vegetable, carrot. And if you want to put another vegetable there and you need to run, go get it, go get it. Fruit, I gave you peaches, not in sugar. But if you don't like sliced peaches in a can, you can change it to a whole one. Just tell me why. I want you to think it out and what you might have to do to it, OK? Grain, I gave you rice. I know it's not in New Orleans. In New Orleans, it's easy to give people rice. Around here, you might not know exactly what to do with it. A lot of people do it for breakfast foods, but you can mix it with anything that you do. Basically, the same things you do with a pasta, you can do with a rice. But if you don't know how to cook with rice, then you can change it. I just want you to think it out. I want you to think why I have to substitute, because what I like isn't there, but I want to make it correct. And then a dairy. If you want to put a, um, in this group, um, I'm going to use, we'll, we'll, we'll use the American cheese, okay? And just kind of think of a meal that you could do with those items. And if you can't come up with one, just think of something from the pantry and put it back on, and we're going to see how you do. This side of the room, we're going to use ground lean turkey, okay? All right, ooh, well, you can do the same thing with it you can do with ground meat. You'd probably never know the difference if you didn't know the color difference, all right? We're going to use a pasta. You can choose what type of pasta you like. We'll use applesauce. Spices can be used as long as they're not hot to your tongue. You cannot use red peppers, but you can use cinnamon, you can use nutmegs. Those things naturally decrease motiv motility, so they're always handy to use. And uh, cinnamon actually can help with the blood sugars a little bit, so those things are fine to use. Um, we'll use... Um, for our vegetable, let's use zucchini. 
It can be a squash, yellow, but remember zucchini is a little bit better tolerated. Actually, almost can be eaten raw, so it's only one of the few ones we can do that with. And let's do, um, I'm going to use a Greek yogurt with that. And you can put a little bit in your Greek yogurt, and if you want to do something creative with it, um, I will give you a hint. I do most sauces that we make, most sauces that I have to create, come from low-fat yogurt. Sometimes I use a lot of Greek yogurt because it's a little bit smoother and it's a little higher in protein too. But, um, but it's a real doable one if you can, and you can actually get lactose free on the market pretty good now too. But that's something that you can do with it. So, um, so I'm going to give you five minutes. Let's see what you come up with and then we'll talk about it. I just want you to think through the process of getting foods together and then we'll, um, and, and it's going to be fun a second and then we'll share some of our ideas. And um, I want to go through just making sure that before you leave here, you know a little bit about how we select foods, okay? And how you make a meal plan. Because let me tell you what the secret is. The secret is, think about it the day before you do it. By thinking about it now and making you think about what you would put on a plate will help you decide what you're gonna do the next day and the next day. If you wait till you're hungry and try to pick out a food, it's real hard to do because the things that smell the best are the fried foods, right? You don't smell baked chicken very often. You're going to, if you walk in a place, you may, you're going to smell their fried chicken first, and you're not going to tolerate all the fried food. Very few of you are going to tolerate the fried food. The people that do tolerate it probably don't need it either. So, um, so what we can do, um, but what we want to watch these things. So just take a few minutes, and let's put a few things on the plate. Let's talk about it, and then um, I'm going to go back. I'm going to teach you a little bit about label reading, and then we're going to finish this up. So... little bit all right okay so you came up with some plans somebody give me what the real quickly give me what you chose somebody raise their hand and tell me what they put on their plate who, who did I see you looking at me uh-huh that's good yeah uh-huh See, wonderful, okay? So isn't that creative? Y'all give her a hand. That's pretty amazing. I, I think that that's wonderful. So did, it, did anybody else think of that? All right. So that's the, that is the benefit of groups together, is that that's why we, we share, and if we were at tables together, we can really get several different ideas. Anybody else do one on this side? Scared, scared to tell me or scared to do it? All right. Let's go to this side a second. Anybody do it over there? Come up with something? Okay, tell me what you got. Uh huh. Wonderful. See, she got a meal out of that. That's, that's creative. That's what we want to do is think about these normal foods and then take them a little further. Um, let's go through just a few more of um, the vegetables I think people don't get as much. Um, acorn squash. If you can't eat, sweet potatoes can get gassy. And they have a little bit more fiber than the other ones. So if you can't do squash, change to pumpkin or acorn squash. Winter squashes are wonderfully uh, high in antioxidants. And they're very absorbable. They're soluble fibers. And they're very valuable. People just don't use them as much. Beets. If you braise beets, take the greens off. I, this is a concern. A lot of people like to juice. I don't, I'm fine with juicing again, and it's fine as long as you don't put sugar in it and all that fruit juice. But remember, you don't want to use uh, beet greens because they actually can increase your risk of uh, kidney stones, the oxalic acid. But the beets, the roots themselves, are very doable. You can braise them, you can peel them, you can slice them, you can put them in recipes, you can do it with a quinoa and dice it. So there's many things you can do, very, very rich in nutrients. Okay, very good for you. Asparagus is fine. Green beans. There's a few of them. Potatoes are wonderful. They got a bad rep in the, in, in just because people fry them and eat too much of them and put a lot of fat in the mashing of them. 
but if you get the skins off of them and you're, or you eat them that way, they're fine. So I want you to realize that there are many foods out there. I can go through a whole list. I brought a lot of resources uh, with me in case somebody had some questions about some other ideas. And I'll be more than happy working with you with these while I'm here. You've got my time and I'm here. So be sure and be in my ear, especially if you're losing weight or you're having more than four stools a day. Take the time to come and let me help you while I'm here because it really can change a, a difference in your life. So let's look at our label real quick and then we're, while we finish this up. This is a standard label. Everybody has a la every label, everybody has to have this on their foods throughout the country. I talked a little bit about a few of the things that we're gonna watch. Well, this is a big key to the food item. We said you need to be low fat, right? So how do we know how much fat's in an item? Well, if you look at the serving size, this is a cup of this, whatever it is. I'm not too sure exactly, except it's gonna be some type of carbohydrate um, uh, base, uh, starch base. If you look at total calories, 250, right? On this, divide it by half. What's half of 250, 125? How far away is 110 from 125? pretty close, right? So it's almost half fat. It's a high fat product and you're probably not going to tolerate it very well. Okay? You need to drop, you would almost, you would probably do okay with a half a cup of this. See, your portion control, right? Because that would drop your fat down to 50, you know, down to 50 grams and you may be able to, 50 calories, you may be able to tolerate that. But again, total grams of fat here, it says 12, and you need to do five or about five with your food items, okay? Write that down. Five grams with your fat is usually tolerated for people that have sciatoria. Okay, let's go to sugars real quick. So carbohydrates, or total carbohydrates here are 30. Sugars are five. A serving of carbohydrates, if you're a diabetic, we'd say would be 15. And as long as your sugars are five or less, you can tolerate it. So this product is not too high in sugar, so you could have this as far as if you're having fast emptying related to short bowel. This product would be okay. Remember again, five grams of sugar is usually what you're tolerating in these, in these food items, okay? Sodium, we, it's just iffy. I mean, if you're hypertensive, we may be watching it. If we may even need it a little bit, you know, to hold some fluid in the cells. So we don't really watch that so much in here. We don't worry. Cholesterol tend to be low in patients losing weight, so it becomes not quite as big of an issue for us in this arena as well. Protein, we want it high. So uh, five grams is uh, seven grams per ounce is usually a serving of, um, of protein, and we usually use three ounces with a meal. All right, they're wrapping me up. So we want you to be active, remember be active, uh, eat high protein foods, adjust your activity away from your meals, and then um, increase your activity more if you're having constipation. And here's a few of the recipes from a couple groups that have put out some good information and they usually have diarrhea sections as well that you may see that will help you with this. So there's some, also some CAM, I'll give these to you so if they're not in, they're in your handout so you should have a copy. So in summary, nutrition is so important for so many reasons for patients living with neuroendocrine because it is the building blocks of how we do well with our treatments and how we do with just our quality of life factors. And making a meal plan, and that's what we kind of touched on today, make you think. I just want you to think about this. Uh, making these adjustments can really improve your tolerance. Not all diarrhea you're, ha you're having, I can promise you, is related to your tumors. Many of it is from malabsorption of nutrients and the fats and the carbohydrates that you're eating as well. And we don't want to overtreat you with a drug for, for a tumor that we can try to tolerate when it's not really the tumor. You know, it's, it's the other things you're doing. So we want to improve your quality of life by controlling those symptoms. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Leanne. Sorry for pushing you there. <laughs> but we, lunch is waiting. Um, say again? Okay, yeah, Leanne brought some recipe cards. Um, there's, sure. Before I come off this, they didn't have a disclaimer for me. And they, and, but I do have, I need to give a disclaimer. Sure. I should have done it before I started. I am, um, I work for both uh, on a, a board to help with um, Ipsen to give them ideas on the nutrition. They did send me out to talk to nurses and to do some work with them. And I am also a consultant with Novartis for the Sandestatins Eye um, 
do a, uh, education for nurses and physicians around the country, and I'm paid for that as well. And I also write recipes for the Real Support Program, which is part of the Sandestatin um, information as well. And I did, um, so I need to let you know that. I, I did, I, I, but I, it wasn't easy to get that job. <laughs> I, had, I had to fight a long time to get that job um, because I really have done this for so long and just if people don't understand. And the other thing, I, put, I did bring some samples of the um, uh, recipe cards, to have some of them that um, they were so gracious. Uh, my divorce rep came all the way over and brought them to and shipped them out for me. So you can look at them and it give you some more ideas of things that you can use. Okay? Thank you. Oh, Thank you, Ian.